have your Bibles with you this morning, would you open them to the Gospel of Matthew, to the 26th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew? We looked at this incident uh, a couple weeks ago in Mark's Gospel, but we'll be looking at it from a different standpoint this morning. If you're able, please stand for the reading of God's Word. Matthew 26, beginning at verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith unto he unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep. And saith unto Peter, What could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time, and pray, saying, O oh my father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now, take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Bow your heads for a moment. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. I pray you will open it to us this morning and use it for our good. And for that, we'll thank you. Amen. You may be seated. We all know that the night Judas betrayed Jesus, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. He left eight of his 11 disciples at the gate, taking only Peter, James, and John, his inner circle. He entered and bared his heart to them. He said his soul was exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Why would he say that? Because the weight of the world's sin was on his shoulders, and it was literally crushing him. He asked them to tarry and watch with him, and then he went into the garden farther to be alone. They failed at what he asked. After the strongest hour of wrestling and prayer that anyone has ever experienced, Jesus emerged to find his most trusted disciples not watching and praying, but sound asleep. He said, could you not watch with me for just one hour? Then he said, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. We need to be watching for the Lord's coming in these days, but we also need to be watching our heart until he comes, lest sin get the best of us. All Christians need to heed this every day not just in the day we're living in. That they've, this is the way it's always been. It's been said that eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Well, that's true militarily, but it's also true 
spiritually. Now, if we expect to keep from falling into sin after we've been saved and even sanctified, we must make sure that we obey Jesus' command that we watch and pray so that we enter not into temptation. Sin is so subtle that unless we watch and keep our guard up, it can end up getting the best of us again, even after the Lord has saved us from it. And in order to keep from sin, one must constantly watch for it. Not just think about it on Sunday. Every day, one must constantly watch. And no matter how long you've been a Christian or how spiritually grounded you think you are, there are no exceptions to this rule if you expect to keep spiritual victory in your heart and in your life. And don't kid yourself, you do not have spiritual victory in your life if you don't have victory over the sin. In your life. Hebrews 2 1 says we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. You know that people don't usually jump into major sin by leaps and bounds. Backsliding doesn't happen in such a way that this morning you're on fire for the Lord and then tonight on the spur of the moment you decide you're going to go out and get drunk and have an affair. That's not the way it works. Seldom does backsliding ever happen that way. Usually it happens by slipping a little here and then slipping a little more there first and that's why we need to watch but if you let your guard down and if you get lax with say your devotions hope you have them or church attendance especially now since we're meeting just once a week how can you afford to miss before you know it you're going to find yourself slipping a little at first. And if we find ourselves slipping, it will inevitably lead us into some kind of sin. Now, folks, I'll miss you if you're not here when we meet. But I'm not that insecure that I'm going to measure my success or failure as a minister on whether or not you show up. But if you let important things like your attendance at God's house or your devotions, if you let those things slip, I can tell you where it's going to lead you. You are going to find yourself slipping maybe slowly at first but surely you will end up slipping into sin and I guarantee you that if you let your private devotions you let your church attendance slipping off you will end up slipping right back into sin so we must watch and I don't mean watch the other guy. Watch ourselves. Watch our own life. 1 Peter 1.7 says that our faith and our spiritual life is much more precious than gold that perishes. Over the years, gold has been a sought-after treasure. Men have fought and died for gold. In the gold rush days in places like California or 
Colorado or Alaska, if you found any, you had to guard it in order to keep it. And it still must be guarded today, for that matter. I graduated from Nazarene Bible College in Colorado Springs the evening of January 3rd, or J June 3rd, rather, 1974. Within hours, the very next morning, Linda gave birth to our son, Jason. I'll never forget that graduation service. A couple of my buddies kept hollering down while the preacher was preaching, hey, Nick, your wife just ran out. She hadn't. <laughs> Baby waited till the next morning. Once I graduated, I was undecided as to what I was going to do after graduation. Linda and I were praying that the Lord would lead us. I was working at the Air Force Academy, so we didn't have to do anything right away but stay in Colorado Springs and enjoy our new baby and relax. Uh, just working a 40-hour-a-week job would have been relaxing to me after working full-time and carrying a full load at college at the same time. So when I say relaxing, just working a job would have been relaxing to me. I had interviewed with various district superintendents, considering maybe what the Lord would have me to do, and they'd offered me churches. I probably had a dozen or so churches offered to me, anywhere from California to Maine. I also had a friend that wanted me to go with him that summer, as soon as I graduated, to work a gold claim that he had on the Kenai River in Alaska. He and an Air Force colonel had worked that claim three years earlier, and they had gotten an ounce of gold a day off that claim. And they found out once they got done that summer that their sleuth box hadn't even been set up right, so they were losing half the gold that they were finding. And still they were getting an ounce a day. It was a good claim, needless to say. And at that time, gold was worth $500 an ounce. I was making $5 an hour working for the Air Force Academy. My friend John said, and we worked together at the Air Force Academy, and he told me, he said, this colonel that worked with me, he said he, he didn't know enough about the outdoors. He was afraid he was going to get them killed if they went back up to the gold claim together again. He said one day they were waded out in hip boots into the middle of the Kenai River fishing for salmon, Back on the bank, an 800-pound grizzly started tearing up the colonel's backpack. The colonel pulled out a 38 and was about to start shooting at the grizzly when John hit his hand with, the, with his uh, fishing rod to stop him. Now, if you don't know anything about guns... Shooting at that 800-pound grizzly with a 38 would have been about like hitting him with a fly swatter. And probably all that would have happened would have, would have made him mad and he'd come out into the water after them. So you see why John didn't take, want to take that colonel along again. And it was John's claim, not the colonel. So he wanted me to go, and every night at work he would say, you know, you ought to just determine that you're going to go with me. Uh, we're friends, he'd say. You'll work fine up there. He said, you know a lot more about the outdoors than that colonel did. He said, it'll be great. We'll make a lot of money, and it'll be great. And I have to admit that gold looked very attractive, and I struggled over what to do. We could have really used the money just graduating from college, paying our way as we went, 
And believe me, I graduated college, and Linda worked at the Air Force Academy, too. We didn't know a nickel. We worked our way through college. But we hardly had enough furniture to furnish an apartment. And Alaska looked very attractive as far as getting on our feet financially. But I had a wife and a new baby in Colorado Springs. And God had a little church up in Venango County here in Pennsylvania that offered me $30 a week if they had it. And God said, that's where I want you to go. I often wondered what kind of turn my life might have taken had I spent that summer in Alaska looking for gold instead of taking that church. Now, I believe I could have spent those three months up there and not jeopardized my call, but I'm glad I put my wife my son, and the will of God, as well as my spiritual life, ahead of the call of that gold claim on the Kenai River. Peter is right. Your faith and your spiritual life, and I can testify to it, is much more precious than any gold that perisheth. So watch yourself. Don't allow yourself to slip back into sin. Guard your spiritual life more than you would your most precious gold ring because it is more precious than whatever gold you have. H. Orton Wiley, early Nazarene theologian, said this, Holiness purifies the heart so that it is like a garden without weeds. Good description. But remember, in the parable of the tares in Matthew 13, 25, Jesus said, we have an enemy who sows tares among the wheat while men sleep. Tares were weeds. So even after God cleanses the garden of our heart of the weeds, first thing that happens is the devil sets out to try to plant some more again. That parable teaches us that constant watchfulness is needed in order to keep our enemy from sowing the seeds of sin once again in our heart. A lot can happen before we realize it if we fall asleep. Years ago, I, and this was a lot of years ago, I was tracking a buck in the snow in buck season. I looked out ahead and I saw my Uncle Carl sitting next to a tree asleep with his gun on his lap. I followed that buck track and I kept thinking, Where's it, when's it going to weave off? I followed that buck track right up to Uncle Carl. When it put the brakes on, I looked down and I could see that it had literally kicked snow up on him <laughs> where it had hit. And it literally must have looked right over his shoulder and he never knew it was there until I woke him up and showed him the tracks. He couldn't believe he hadn't seen the thing. I said, I wonder why. <laughs> uh, that's how easily sin can slip up on us if we fall asleep. Here's another concept that might help us. 
When we get saved and sanctified, we become like a well-defended city. But after 9-11, you remember we created the Department of Homeland Security to be ever vigilant to guard against terrorists ever pulling that one off again. But we must never forget, never forget that our enemies are always looking for an opportunity to do that same thing over again if we slip up and don't guard ourselves. So we must watch and keep up our guard. Believe me, folks, defunding the police won't do that. Nor will allowing the Black Lives Matter riots to continue. That's not going to do it. One of these days you're going to hear something really nasty beyond just burning the cities down. Temptation is something we must always watch out for and pray against. And yes, even after you have been thoroughly saved and sanctified, you still can and you still will be tempted. Norval Hadley wrote this in his book, Sin in the Sanctified. He said, we must absolutely refuse to comply with temptation under any circumstances and to any degree. The slightest compliance is fraught with the danger of death. Very good. In the world that we live in, especially with the Internet, the ability to act out virtually any temptation you might have is right at your fingertips. You go into your bedroom with your computer, your phone, whatever, nobody even knows. It's right there at your fingertips. We should be prepared for temptation by having our mind already made up as to what course we're going to take if and when it arises in our life. And we must run from anything. Remember how Joseph ran from Potiphar's wife? We must run for, from anything we know is wrong or even questionable. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 warns us to abstain even from all appearance of evil. Even things that might not be clear cut. We should be careful with them. And if you have a question about whether something is right or wrong or not, my advice to you would be, be safe rather than sorry. Don't pride yourself, as so many who call themselves Christians today do, as to how far you can stretch the limit. Sin is so deceitful that you might stretch things farther than what you should. And before you know it, sin has succeeded in creeping right into your life. Eldon Furham has cited the following as evidence that sin is creeping in. A. When one finds doing God's will a duty rather than a delight. B, when he finds it easy to do wrong but hard to do right. C, when he discovers a presence of inward attitudes that tend to be unchristlike. 
D. When he discovers unwillingness to be crucified with Christ, as Peter did. E. When he feels any spiritual dullness. Then listen what he says here. Next. He says a sinner is dead to spiritual things. A carnal man is alive but dull. A spiritual man is alive and alert. End quote. Whenever sin begins to creep into our lives, we begin to lose our joy. But it doesn't disappear all at once. Sin creeps in gradually. It sneaks up on us. As it does, we begin to lose our power along with our joy we start to discover that we can no longer testify or pray with any sense of power. If that has been happening to you, those signs should be an alarm going off in your head, telling you to watch out because sin is in the process of creeping in. Don't put off doing something about it if you hear the alarm. Run to Jesus. Seek his help, even his forgiveness if you need it, before it starts getting too bad. Let me ask you, would you watch a little flame flicker out in the kitchen until the whole house had gone up in flames before you called the fire company? Of course not. You'd look for the fire extinguisher at the first smell of smoke. But most of us get far more alarmed by a little smoke than we do by a little sin. We should watch for even the tiniest signs of sin's smoke in our life. And as soon as we see it, put it out with the precious blood of Jesus, the best fire extinguisher we could find. For hear me, if you don't, <coughs> sin will get the best of you. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, 6, Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. It only takes a little sin to slip in before you end up going right back into sin. How many lies do you have to tell before you become a liar? Telling just one lie makes you a liar, doesn't it? Just one. Of course it does. Do you have to rob a bank before you're labeled a thief? Hardly. Last time I was in the bathroom at Walmart, the sign on the wall said that if you shoplift just one item from them, that they would prosecute you to the limit as a thief. So all I have to do is one time, one, one little thing, just put a little thing of deodorant in your pocket and try to walk out. That makes you a thief, whatever it is. When the Lord sanctifies our soul, he cleanses our heart from sin, and he makes us holy. How many sins need to slip in after your heart has been cleansed? before you cease to be holy. If you said any number beyond one, you're wrong. 
So any and every type of sin must be watched for and guarded against. There's just no other way to slice it. And the good news is you can't do it on your own. But Jesus and the power of the blood of Jesus will help you to do it. Jesus said, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Saw what happened to the disciples when they didn't do what he said. They fell asleep. If you don't do that, sin will catch you sleeping and it will creep back into your life. And for most of you, especially some of you that have served the Lord 20, 30, 40, 50 years, that's the last thing you want to happen, isn't it? To walk with the Lord all these years and then let your guard down in your latter years and sin flip back in. It happens, and it's terrible when it happens. So no matter how long we've been at this, if you're relatively new at walking with the Lord, or if you think you're an old pro at this and you've been af after this now, going this way for 40, 50 years, you still got to play by the rules. You still got to watch and pray. Because if you don't, there it is. The devil will be ready to sow tares again in your weedless garden. And especially as close as the Lord's coming must be, who among us can afford that to happen in our lives? Let's stand. Bow your head. Peter tells us our spiritual life is much more precious than of gold that perisheth. You say, well, I, I, I guess I don't have to worry about that, preacher. I don't have any gold. Whether you have any gold or not, gold can be anything that you hold more precious than the Lord. That could be considered your gold. So I say to you, is there anything in your life that you hold more precious than the Lord? If there is, better be careful because that thing, that person, that whatever will cause you to let your spiritual life slip. And that's not something you want to let happen. Let's join together. And a closing word of prayer. And I encourage you, if the Lord has put, any, put his finger on anything and said, hey, here's something you better watch out for, it could end up taking you the wrong way. Listen to what he says and don't let it happen. Jeff, would you please dismiss us with prayer?